progress. But just one minute, um, um, Paula, is it okay if you just forward the link to them? Because I don't even see uh, Jilo here as well. Hello, everyone, and good day. My name is Betty Adera. I work at Global Communities as the Senior Technical Advisor for HIV AIDS and Health and I am based in Nairobi, Kenya. I welcome you all to today's session, whose theme is elevating community health systems as a pathway to equity and resilience. This session is co-hosted by Global Communities and IntraHealth International. We look forward to unpacking the role of community health workers in advancing health equity, best practices, and global policy initiatives in health systems resilience at community level. Earlier this year, Global Communities and IntraHealth International combined to foster cross-sectional collaboration and increase access to health services for greater impact in global health. We take a holistic approach to global health across the development and humanitarian sectors. We are committed to strengthening community health systems through workforce development, data-based and community-based approaches to reach vulnerable populations in over 30 countries. And this aligns very well with the theme of this session. Allow me to mention a few uh, notes in regards to housekeeping in so far as this session is concerned. So this session is recorded and at the end of it, if you want to come back to it, you will be able to do so through the link of the symposium. I urge that you keep an eye on the chat for bios of panelists and the links to additional resource materials and announcements. And also, uh, we will be asking you time after time to put your questions in the chat and hopefully we will have uh, a time to, to take a couple of them at the end of this session. So now moving forward to my panel today, um, while we're still waiting for a few panelists to join, I will go ahead and introduce the full panel. We are expecting Jilo Boru, who is a health extension supervisor and nutrition focal person at the Oromia region, Borena Zone Health Office, Ministry of Health, Government of Ethiopia supporting the Reaper program. We also had MF, we also have MFA Baido, who's the Deputy Chief of Party, USAID Enhancing Wash Activity at Global Communities in Ghana. We also have Gala Moses, who is the Deputy Chief of Party, USAID Advancing a HIV and AIDS epidemic control activity at IntraHealth International in South Sudan. Last but certainly not least, we have Rachel Dusum, who is the Director of Global Health Practice at Chemonix. In this panel discussion, I will be posing a round robin of questions to each panelist to better understand the context in which they work in including their experience working with community health workers to deliver essential primary health care services, disseminate vital information, and ensure that communities remain healthy and resilient during crisis. We also hope, like I've said before, to spare some time at the end of the, at the, end of the engagement for audience interaction through a Q&A and comments uh, in the chat. So allow me to take this moment to go to our first round of questions and I will start with you, MFA. So my question is that uh, considering that you lead WASH and health emergency response programs supporting community health workers in fragile and crisis settings in Ghana, could you please share a few words about this program, the context you work in, and your perspectives on the role of community health workers. Over to you, MFA. So thank you. Thank you, Betty, and good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Yes, yeah, so 
As I said, I'm based in Ghana, so I'm talking from the Ghana office. And then um, currently we are implementing the Enhancing Wash, which is a five years USID behavioral led project. So it was modified in um, 2022 for us to be able to implement the Global Vax project. So the Global Vax project basically is to support the government of Ghana to scale up the intake of vaccination in the country. So we worked in about eight regions, that is basically half of the country, and in about 111 districts to make sure that people are get coming out to take the vaccine, because indeed it was really a challenge. Before we were approached by USAID, the percent, the coverage was below between six to 20%. But then before we could even run down the project, we had scaled up. So we worked in the 25, about 350 island. That is what people called overbanks. We worked in hard to reach areas. And then we also worked in the Fulani communities. Apparently we also were supposed to focus a lot on the elderly and then disabled. So if you talk about um, the role of the community health workers, they serve as the entry point. Under this project, we needed them the most because they serve as the entry point. They link the health system to the community, which led to a lot of coordinated participatory approach, right? So they really supported us to co-design our strategies and then to also make sure that we are using them to generate demand. Well, the other thing that we think they really did very well for us is they supported us with advocacy and education. They really educated the people well, made them to understand the program, made them to know the benefit of coming out to take the COVID-19 vaccination. By mind, it was a pandemic situation, actually. So we had to also really use them. So they really came in very handy to support in the response of the pandemic and then the disease outbreak. One thing that we find very useful is they supported with the improvement of health equity because they were in the community. They knew the community people, they understood their cultures, they knew the, all the determinants. So they were able, and then of course, because they were in community again, they had the community trust. So they were able to really, and people were able to really listen to them, community members listen to them. And then they were also doing the door to door. That is where they were able to improve the health equity. So they had to go to all the way to even the remote communities, over banks had to reach areas to make sure that they got the vaccines. So this is how they supported to improve health equity. I think um, basically also with them, I see them also being creating a lot of linkages between the community and the health system and then also with the project, actually. So they really came in, their role was very critical during this uh, pandemic to really tackle and handle the pandemic, to curtail it. Their role was very critical in scaling up the COVID-19 vaccination uptake in Ghana. So over to you, Betty. Okay, thank you very much, uh, MFR, for highlighting for us the great work that you do uh, in Ghana uh, with the COVAX and, and WASH uh, programming area. And of course, highlighting the critical role of uh, community health workers in demand creation, scaling up of projects, educating you know, community members on health issues that community members have trust in them is a critical and powerful point that you have pointed out. And of course, the linkages uh, that they carry out uh, between community themselves, health systems, uh, and the program. So thank you very much, MFA, for highlighting to us. Now, Rachel, yes, so just, uh, I'm... Just to just add this critical point to Ed, you know, okay. because um, the community also trusted them so much, what we did was we leveraged on that and then we used them to really translate some of the messages in, in terms of SBCC messages. You know, some of the okay. messages, we couldn't just speak the language, right? We did the general one, but then there were minority communities that we couldn't understand the language. And then we didn't even know what was culturally appropriate for the people. So the community health workers came in handy to really interpret those messages. And guess what? They were the people telling them where the vaccinations would be held, where they could get the vaccines, how they could go in there and take the vaccines, which was very critical. They also helped to develop the messages. Of course, we're sitting in uh, the, the region thinking that this message was suitable, but that the community health workers, because they were the linkage to the community point of entry, they came to us to tell us that some of the, some of the words wouldn't sink down with the people. 
So please help us change the messages. So we brought them on board to even design some of the tailor-made messages for the communities, okay. which was culturally appropriate and acceptable. So this really helped generate a lot of demand because the people could relate to the messages. They were very comfortable with the people. So it really generated demand and eventually scaled up in the community uh, in them in the uptake of the COVID-19 vaccination. That is from 2022 to 20. I mean, March 2024, actually. Thank you, and over. Thank you very much, uh, MFR, for, for that edition. Certainly uh, impressive work that you and your team are, are continuing to do uh, over there in Ghana. Now, Rachel, allow me to turn over to you. And you've heard what MFR has said in terms of the context in Ghana, uh, working with community health workers at the grassroots community level, and of course the linkages that they have with the health systems and programs such as the ones that we implement. So if you could please share now at a higher global level, your perspectives on how governments then and development partners can ensure that community health programs and their workers are sustainably funded and prioritized. Over to you, Rachel. Thanks so much, Betty, um, and thanks so much for the opportunity to engage on this panel. I know we were expecting to have a few more country examples and, um, you know, descriptions of um, ways that community health workers have really been able to respond and adapt and really drive equity in any countries and, you know, any global health um, sort of situation, filling gaps as we go. Um, so I'm gonna start with a bird's eye view when we're talking about funding. Ministries of health continuously struggle to make the case to ministries of finance and the broader government for a larger health budget. The pie is small, um, despite our collective recognition that health is our first wealth. You know, the 15% investment um, per the Abuja declaration that a government which should invest 15% of its um, public resources into health is not met in most places. Um, and the sector tends to be seen as consumptive and pulling resources as opposed to being productive. Um, but we know health is our first wealth. And in most countries of that health pie, we see that half to 80% of the budget is dedicated to health worker salaries. And those are long-term commitments. That's all the way to the pension um, you know, of any given health worker. We can't reasonably expect development partners to take on those salaries and those long-term commitments. Although we can learn a bit from PEPFAR and its emergency response when it was doing that and, and how it's had to transition off. So, but when ministries of health are trying to prioritize jobs across the entire health system, from cardiologists and other specialists in tertiary hospitals, all the way to community-based health workers, they're all important and it's really hard for them to prioritize. But hopefully they can refer to comprehensive and costed national human resources for health strategies that are informed by timely, accurate health workforce data. Too often, those data and, and the timeliness of those reports are not very reliable, um, and they don't always include community health workers, whether those are volunteer or salaried community health workers. So in this context, development partners are seeking to align and to coordinate with strategies and fill gaps and being responsive to what the ministry in the country is asking them to do. Um, but unfortunately, because of all of what I was describing, this can result in a lot of siloed and fragmented sort of stopgap investments in training, supervision, stipend support, and incentives for community health workers, for specific disease programs. Um, and what we're also seeing is given that challenge of fiscal space, a lot of national community health programs are financed by external donors. Um, and that's medium term, and there's not really a clear plan of how they will continue to be sustained. So given this context and the challenges, some of the solutions that I propose to sustainably plan for and prioritize community health worker programs are one, digitize and integrate community health workers within human resource information systems and broader health planning. So you can plan better 
and really demonstrate the contributions to health outcomes. Primary healthcare requires both facility and community-based workers, and countries need to look at that full picture and all of the interprofessional ways that primary care can be delivered. But if you can't measure or understand where those community health workers are, it's really hard to manage and plan. So we need to make a better case. We need the evidence, we need the data. Um, and as part of Frontline Health Worker Coalition, um, one of our members, the Community Health Impact Coalition, or SHEIC, is really an incredible clearinghouse of research and of evidence, and they've contributed to some guidelines about how you can digitize um, CHW um, and human resource information systems. Two, we need to create professional learning paths for community health workers. It's not the end of the line. We need more health workers. We need intrinsically motivated health workers that know communities that are, are interested and committed to working in rural and underserved areas to address equity. Um, and most community health workers, as you well know, are stars in their communities, they're trusted, they're upwardly mobile, and they want to keep learning and growing and being effective at their work. We need more allied health professionals, we need more midwives and lab techs, especially in rural areas. And if community health workers don't have a career path, then they may not stick around and benefit those populations that they're serving. Um, and we need them to build new skills. As for those of you working in health, there is never a dull moment. Um, there are emerging infectious diseases. There are, you know, there's the crisis of climate change. I'm here in Tokyo at the Health Systems Research Symposium, and it's really focused on planetary health and the role of human health, animal health, environmental health, and how we're facing an aging population. There's a lot of potential of new health technologies. We need trusted people from the communities to speak to what health needs are and to really adapt and contextualize all of these issues and solutions in a way. And, and if we're not there for community health workers, there's not an opportunity for that. And then third, we need to sustain we need to sustain financing in some way, um, particularly when it comes to last mile supplies and how effective community health workers are with all of the technologies, supplies, medicines that they can offer. Um, we need to look at market solutions, private sector innovations. Um, you know, as an example, lady health workers in Pakistan will often sell soap and other health products at a reasonable cost, and that can be an income generator, and that brings them into communities, and that helps to subsidize their own income. Um, we need more examples like that to expand access in underserved areas to really promote equity. I'll stop there for now. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel, for highlighting to us the critical importance at higher policy government level, uh, the, the, the need to move away from siloed, fragmented approaches uh, to engagement and management of our community health workers. And of course, the critical importance of data uh, as relates to health uh, workforce uh, that will then help uh, improve programming and make, of course, real-time uh, decisions. The issue around professional development um, pathways and opportunities for community health workers is one issue that always comes up everywhere whenever we speak about community health workers and we hope that uh, we are adding to, to more to that particular voice, uh, calling a, 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 a global, a global uh, elevated voice on that particular area. And of course, their critical importance as now the world continues to consider the One Health approach. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, Rachel, for that. Uh, we are still having our two panelists uh, having a connectivity issue. So we will uh, continue and as and when they're able to join, then we will incorporate them. So at this point, MFA, allow me to come back to you. And I wanna ask uh, you to speak a little bit about from your perspective as an INGO uh, worker, uh, program manager that supported the Ghana government in the response to COVID-19 pandemic. What lessons uh, could you share with us in this platform about ensuring that health services are resilient and are equitable during a disease outbreak? Over to you, MFA. Okay, so thank you so much. I think um, 
Um, some of the practical lessons that we learned, first of all, was the, was the high level political and administrative support. That's one of the things we learned. So yes, it was a pandemic. It was not going to be business as usual. Um, everybody had to respond and then it was a priority. So we let the lesson that we learned from Ghana during the pandemic was there was a very high level political and administrative support to improve health. It was very critical to the Ministry of Health at that time. So Ghana had an all of society approach in improving their health outcomes. So it really helped for, the, for things to move faster, for the system to move faster, and then for us to make sure that the system is also being strengthened in the process. Because if you don't have their buy-in, if you don't have the government's buy-in, then you couldn't do much. But the lessons that we learned as an INGO during this time was that we really, really had a high level support. We had the government very willing to make sure that they really move forward with every strategies that we brought to also make sure that people got to know that, hey, it is a pandemic, it is an emergency. We need to respond as quickly as we could, which was very great and it was a lesson that we learned. The other thing too that we learned was early mobilization. It is not business as usual. So we really need to get down there to see how best and fast we could really mobilize things. Coming from gap analysis, what do we need? What are the gaps? Timely provision of those resources that was needed. Mobilization of human resource. That in, in this case, it was the community health workers. We really need to reach out quickly to the, to the district at the district level, talk to the district directors to tell them that, hey, we need these people. If you have assigned them to any other um, routine, this is something that we please need you to support us. And don't forget, I mean, they were very good at uh, supporting in the emergency and uh, because it was pandemic. So we quickly have to mobilize as fast as we can. So for us, we had to even get consultants to move because as I said earlier on, we were working in eight regions. That is about 111 districts. So we quickly have to move consultants to go and quickly conduct the gap analysis with the district directors, that is district health directors at that level for us to understand what the gaps are and then for, for us to quickly provide those resources. And the timely provision of the resources was something that we learned that could really scale up vaccination uptake, whether COVID, whether polio, any vaccination uptake. In fact, I think any primary healthcare intervention, timely resource, um, uh, availability of timely resources, and then also releasing it on time really helps to scale up. Again, what we, what we learned practically working with the government is effective planning, coordination, and orientation. We really need to effectively plan. What do we want to do? Because we have the data, okay? The government had at that time given us the data and they were struggling in regions that USAID had access had, had to support. Now, this data is clearly telling you that there's a need. There's a MFR, need. You, you have muted your, you have muted yourself so continue please okay so clearly you had the data right and the data tells you that there's a need so and what are we going to do so we had to do we had to look at how we could effectively plan coordinate and orient so that is something that we learned. And then when we talk about planning, we have to plan with all the relevant stakeholders. We have to coordinate, even with some of the IPs that were already working there and doing something in those communities, we have to quickly come and coordinate with them to see how we could scale up the vaccination, the COVID-19 vaccines. And then another thing that we did was to orient. Okay, because people, it was business as usual for people. So you need to orient them to tell them that, no, this is a pandemic era. We really need to go there to save life. So we really need to go deploy those vaccines, map out how we're going to deploy the vaccines, orient them, let them know that this is the time that we have to get in down there to make sure that people would be able to accept to take the COVID-19 vaccine so that we could scale up and then we could also make sure that we are capturing data. That's another thing. Now, what we also learned was to uh, integration of health service delivery was something that we learned. Now, if you are able to integrate 
uh, the, uh, the, where we're able to integrate COVID-19 vaccination into primary health care system so that people, and then at this point in time, we as GC, we're trying to use almost all the OPDs, including the, the EPIs, that is those who are really responsible for persons, and then those who are also responsible to get in there in the community, again, the community health works, including the volunteers. So we learned that when we are able to integrate different approaches, and then we are able to make sure that they understand the need to integrate it, it really helped. It saved time, it saved resources. There were cases where we have to integrate the uptake of polio for kids together with the vaccination. So you see that the teams were moving in pairs, plus the somebody who was taking records and capturing data. So we realized that also really helped us. And this is a lesson that we have learned. And I'm glad to share with the assistance now, the government of Ghana had adapted that approach that at times they would have to combine two, integrate two campaigns. And it's really helping a lot. And this is something that we learned. We just tried it and then fortunately it has worked. So that is something that um, we did. Another thing that we did was to map out in the communities, using the community, again, using the community health workers. As uh, I earlier on said, the trust was there and they, they lived with the people they understand the people, they know what will work, what will not work. So using the community health nurses is something that we learn at the grassroots. And especially if you want to pr promote equity and resilience, we cannot do without them. So we really use them in terms of co-designing some of the strategies. And we used multiple strategies because uh, Ghana is a bit diverse. We have different cultures, different beliefs. So we didn't have one size tailor fit strategy so we really engaged in using multiple strategies and then we realized that the multiple strategies came as a result of we engaging the community health workers because as i said they have the community trust so because we're able to use them we're able to really really generate a lot of demand and they were also able to advocate to break the, the hesitancy uh, there were places that we went they said they were not going to take it because it was a taboo. We brought in a community health volunteer. He understood the language. He spoke to them. Hesitancy was, but before we could leave there, we had always we had almost vaccinated about hundred people. So that's one of the lessons that we learned that if you want to really succeed, go to the grassroots, go to the community health workers. They are in the community. The people trust them. They provide community uh, health service that they at least they give the people the primary health needs that they need. So they know them. And that is something that we also learned. Another thing that we did was um, capacity building. And uh, this we were doing probably before any campaign will start, we we're trying to build the capacities of the volunteers. Again, to keep on letting them know that it's a pandemic, you need to move with that pace. It's not business as usual, so keep on going. I mean, encouraging them. And then there are times that even there are complaints that we get that we have to also share with them. So what we did was after every campaign, we came back, we took feedback from the community, we took feedback from the influencers, from the champions, and then we used that to build their capacity and prepare them for their next uh, vaccination uptake, which is something that we also led. And again, if you want to strengthen the system, you need to continuously build the capacity of the people. If you assume that they've been doing this for long, you may be mistaken. Because before a pandemic, they are used to the routine services that they provide. And routine services, most of them, are, of course, we all know some of them will do it diligently, others will not. But then if you keep on orienting them, if you keep on building their capacity, they are able to really deliver. And that is something that we really did. Now, another thing we did was motivation. We have to motivate them. And then not only to motivate them, timely release of their funds motivated them, which we did. We use the e-platform. So basically the money goes to the, 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 the staff or the volunteer that worked. It's something that we learned. It, and over time, we realized that it, it, it started strengthening the system. And then some of the IPs also started using it. And the Ghana government is also using it for some of their programs, whereby you motivate them and then it goes directly into the volunteer's pocket. In this case, in their, their mobile money wallet. So it's not like you are giving the money to the district director to end up deciding how he wants to pay the people. This one, you have all agreed. They know probably they're taking $20 
per day. They know they are taking their fuel. They know they are taking immediately after they finish carrying out the activities, their tasks that have been assigned after they achieve their target, they are getting their money. So when we were able to motivate them timely and at least realistically, we, we saw that there was a lot of increase in most of the regions that we work, in fact, the district that we work. Another thing that we, we saw, we, 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 we did to strengthen the system was their data. We were feeding into the government data. We didn't want to do anything in isolation. So we were working hand in hand with the government. Now we have to strengthen that as well. So we're using their own staff, train them on data collection. We talk about quality data that they could collect it and feed it into the system. At the point in time, they were a bit worried because they thought we were going to have a parallel structure from the, what the existing structure that they had. We didn't do that. So for us to have a smooth implementation of the project, we had to work with them. Okay, And then we have to strengthen the system by making sure that we use their own data officers to collect the data. So they gathered the data for us at every point in time where there was the need for us to have a backstop. We use them to gather the data and then they fit into the national. So as we speak now, they could only say, okay, GC contributed probably 60% of the result, but then it's one data. So when you go to DIS, you just see that we just fed into that data, which also really helped us. Now, what we also learned was the influencers, the religious leaders, they are the market queens, they are so they are so 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 impactful. You can't believe it. We got into one market. We had they had a market queen that was in charge of selling tomatoes. We thought, oh, this is a small, this is just a lady selling tomatoes. The followers that they have, all the people selling tomatoes apparently are so loyal to this market queens. So we just realized that if you really want to succeed in any pandemic, at least for our from what we observed and the lessons that we learned, if you want Thank to scale you. it up, Thank if you want to curtail it as fast as possible, use these market queens. They are in the community. People are loyal Thank to them. You. Religious leaders. We use the mosque. Yeah. We use the imams a lot. And before we started this program, we thought they were just in the community. Yes. But then we didn't know they have so much listenership. They, they have so much followers. People respect them. So when we use them, realize that people started, it broke the vacant, uh, the, reason, the hesitancy, especially when they came out themselves to take the injections. And again, no. referring back to what I earlier on said, it was the community health workers that convinced them. So they, right. they, was, they were doing a lot of advocacy. Thank you. So Thank you. when they used it, we realized that we're scaling up on the uptake of COVID-19 vaccination in our community. So thank you so much, thank Betty. You. Wow, MFA, that's a, a load of information. Very rich information uh, from your experience in Ghana. Of course, if governments don't buy in, uh, then there's not much anybody uh, can do. So thank you for rallying them, you know, for the buy-in, of course, timely uh, resource um, allocation and movement you know, across the various levels to get the work done. A uh, very critical point around integration of health delivery service, which is a rallying call even today post, you know, the COVID uh, pandemic, capacity building of community health workers. We cannot say that enough. Of course, their motivation and, uh, you know, the use of, of evidence, uh, real-time evidence for real-time uh, decision-making as a key lesson learned. So thank you so much, uh, MFA. Rachel, I turn back to you again. And uh, we all work and live in increasingly in an increasingly and fragile world where global pandemics, as MFA has already said, protracted you know, conflicts and climate disasters have dramatic impacts on the health and well-being of affected populations. So could you share with us some um, existing global or regional policy initiatives that support community health workers uh, in this particular regard. Over to you, Rachel. Thanks so much, Betty. Um, so if we're to reflect a bit, the first health workers in our documented history were community health workers. They knew their communities, they were the healers, they were um, you know, making use of plant medicine and indigenous knowledge. Um, and, you know, that has obviously shifted into 20th century barefoot doctors in China, ashes in India, 
Um, but there was there was a bit of separation from the formal health system, focusing on biomedical and curative services. Um, and, you know, thankfully, this is changing. Um, and specifically, as I think many of you are aware, in 2018, the WHO guideline recommendations for optimizing community health worker programs was really a landmark recognition of the really necessary role and importance of community health systems and community basins from WHO and, um, and all of the contributors span the life cycle of a community health worker from how they're selected and trained to how they're contracted and paid, remunerated, supervised. Um, but it did include specifically that they should be remunerated, that there should be fair pay. Um, and ultimately ensure that they're integrated and really optimized as part of community health systems, which is critical to primary care, and it leads you on a path to universal health coverage. And when we are thinking a little more holistically on, on primary care, um, as a steering committee member of the Frontline Health Worker Coalition, we have some um, high level recommendations um, and guidance for investing in PHC and in frontline health workers, including community health workers. Um, you know, that it's essential for saving lives, increasing life expectancy and the quality of life um, over time and promoting health equity. Um, and given the overall shortages in health workers, um, you know, and for the reasons I was describing above that we really need to, to fill in the gaps, develop the, the plan for more um, really intrinsically motivated primary care focused health workers. Um, and they offer a strong return on investment, potentially 10 to one return on investment. Um, and not only is it a win for the community that benefits from health, um, where it may, an access to health services that may not be. It better supports the health system by being more diverse and aware and adaptable and resilient. Um, given that the majority of our frontline health workers are women, um, it's a gender equity win, um, and it's also a contributor to economic growth. So community health workers, like all health workers, deserve to be paid fairly and they should work in safe conditions. Saving lives should not mean that you risk your own. Um, and the WHO also has um, some important guidance on the, um, the Global Health Worker Compact um, and some of the basic conditions for occupational safety and health that do need to extend to any community health worker. Um, the other global initiative that I want to highlight um, from those 2018 guidelines was the Community Health Roadmap, um, and that was a collaboration of, of um, external, you know, global partners working with countries on their national community health worker plans. And last year, the roadmap was reborn um, as the Community Health Delivery Partnership, or the CHDP. Um, and by bringing together those national, regional, global partners, country governments and other ministries and other sectors, um, as well as civil society, and really importantly, community health workers themselves, um, along with donors, the Community Health Worker um, Delivery Partnership tries to align resources and to better coordinate technical assistance and track progress and make the case for community health workers um, and to really advocate for those investments. Um, I know on the coalition, we always really want to assert that, you know, any panel or any discussion that takes place about community health workers needs to include a community health worker. And I know that was the plan. Um, I was trained as a doula, which is a, a non-clinical, you know, birth assistant. So you've got, you know, you've got someone covered, although I don't have, um, you know, mo most recent experience. Um, but I, you know, I, I think there's, there's a lot of momentum when we see the ways that there are new investments and global health, as I'd mentioned, for climate change, for um, pandemic preparedness, a lot needs to happen at the front lines when it comes to community surveillance and having trust, combating misinformation. And, and so there's just um, so much that's really important. Um, I was going to mention the Health Workers Save Lives campaign, but I see um, my colleague Tina um, has mentioned that. So I'll pass it back over to you, Betty. Thanks.
Thank you very much, Rachel, for highlighting to us, you know, the two uh, main global uh, uh, initiatives for community health workers around their protection, you know, ensuring that their work environment is apt. And of course, also the roadmap, CHW roadmap that in, in engaged solicited engagement of CHWs themselves in terms of provision of TA coordination and investments. Thank you, thank you very much. Before I turn it over to Tina, uh, just urging uh, the, the, the audience that please, in case you have any question, don't be left, left out, please uh, put it in the chat. We'll see how much we can uh, respond to within the time we have. If not, we'll still respond you know, as we move forward. So I welcome you, Tina, at this point. Tina is the lead for the workforce, uh, the, the Frontline Health Workforce uh, Coalition at IntraHealth. So Tina, if you could unmute yourself and very briefly in under three minutes, speak to us about um, this particular coalition and where you see it going. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Betty, and thanks for this opportunity to speak at this amazing panel. Um, as Rachel mentioned, the Frontline Health Workers Coalition is really dedicated to global advocacy across all the cadres of the health workforce. So community health workers, nurses, doulas, pharmacists, and others. And the coalition is actually a 12 year old organization that is hosted by IntraHealth International, which is part of the global communities family. Um, and we are so excited to talk about the Health Workers Save Lives campaign. We launched this at the UN General Assembly this September, along with Seed Global Health. And basically, one of the things we wanted to do was provide an opportunity for not just health workers, but also their supporters, advocates, communities to speak up for health workers and speak up about their support for health workers. As we all know, health workers are overworked, underpaid, under resources, under protected, and often unable to find decent employment in their home countries. So this campaign, which is going to run through at least September of next year, is really an opportunity for the global community and health workers as well to not only share their stories, but also speak up and do advocacy and show support through social media, op-eds and other ways. Um, I've shared the website uh, on the chat and please feel free to reach out if you have any questions and we love to have organizations and people join this great campaign. So just as a quick um, background, the campaign actually builds on World Health Worker Week, which the coalition has been hosting. Um, World Health Worker Week is from April 1 through 7 every year. Last year, we reached an audience of 95 million just in one week. So if you can imagine what we can do in a year of advocating for health workers and making sure health workers are priority. So if we pull together, I think we can reach our target of 150 million this year but we need everyone's help. And quite frankly, health workers need this advocacy. They, they need and deserve the support that we can give them. Thank you, Betty. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tina, for highlighting that. I see our time is pretty much up, but like I said, we will respond to the questions in the chat. And at this point, I'd like to ask uh, MFR and Rachel in under 30 seconds, what is your parting shot looking into the future? 30 seconds, please. 
Well, I think um, for the community health workers, um, we have to build their capacity. It's really important. And then the government also have to have policies that would guide them so that they are working within a certain framework, which is very important. So I think uh, basically capacity building, government policies, and then proper remuneration that will be well paid. So thank you. Thank you very much, MFA, for such a, 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 a strong, uh, punchy uh, parting shot. Uh, Rachel, over to you. I agree wholeheartedly. What I'll add is um, they need to consider the cost of a purely curative health system against investments in prevention, proactive surveillance and preparedness, and entrusted patient-centered care. We're facing a caregiving crisis and community health workers and health systems are essential. Um, they need a community health worker at the table during every major policy discussion on health where community health workers can tell the stories firsthand of the impact that they're making in communities. Community health workers lead complex and very important work, and they build an essential bridge that gets us closer to health equity. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rachel, of course, both of you for highlighting the importance of capacity building of community health workers, compensation, patient-centered care, and of course, meaningful uh, engagement of uh, community health workers and all other stakeholders to achieve health equity. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this uh, session and in under one minute, allow me just to make uh, some two critical uh, announcements. One is, uh, please, please, please tune in tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time for the closing plenary. Uh, the title is of, of that session is Navigating the Future, Driving Global Health Program Progress in 2025, during which the global community's president and CEO, uh, Carrie hessler Radelet will share her insights on health and resilience. And again, building on what uh, Tina said, Please join the campaign on social media using hashtag health workers save lives. I repeat, hashtag health workers save life. Uh, thank you so much, MFA, Baido Global Communities Ghana, and Rachel Dusom uh, from Kimonix, and all participants for your valuable contributions and time, uh, and also your suggestions and, 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 and questions uh, in, the, in the chat. I thank also the organizers of this symposium for the opportunity for us global communities and IntraHealth International to host this session. Thank you very much, everyone, and I wish you a great rest of your day and a pleasant uh, symposium, even tomorrow as we end it. Thank you very much, and uh, thank have a good you. Day. All right, thank you.